As your flight training progresses, your instructor will give you the flight controls more often and let you take command of the airplane. At first, a takeoff may seem complicated, but soon you'll perform each takeoff with ease. Before any takeoff, however, you need to complete the pre-takeoff checklist. When you have completed the checklist, contact the tower for takeoff clearance. Then check the traffic pattern, including the arrival and departure paths for other aircraft. As you taxi onto the runway, align the airplane with the center line and roll forward enough to center the nose wheel. Choose a point that is aligned with the runway. Use it as a reference for maintaining runway heading after you're airborne. This is a good time to turn on your transponder. Also, make a quick check of the wind sock to verify the wind direction and speed. To prevent inadvertent use of the brakes during takeoff, slide your feet down so that the balls of your feet are on the lower part of the rudder pedals. Begin the takeoff roll by applying full power. As the airplane accelerates, glance at the engine instruments and the tachometer to confirm that takeoff power is available. If the winds are calm or are directly down the runway, keep the ailerons neutral during the ground roll. As the airplane accelerates, maintain directional control with smooth, positive rudder pedal pressure. Rudder effectiveness will increase as the airspeed increases. As the airspeed approaches liftoff speed, smoothly apply back pressure to rotate the airplane to the takeoff attitude. In most training airplanes, this attitude is similar to the normal climb attitude. Maintain this attitude until the airplane lifts off the runway. With the proper attitude, your airplane will become airborne near the climb speed. You should then adjust this pitch attitude to maintain climb airspeed. Maintain the runway heading until reaching a safe turning altitude. At this point, if you plan to stay in the traffic pattern, initiate a turn to the crosswind leg. If not, depart the area according to local procedures. The previous takeoff discussion assumed that the wind was light or directly down the runway. But what do you do if you have a crosswind? A crosswind tends to push and roll the airplane to the downwind side of the runway. The nose of the airplane will also have a tendency to turn into the wind. This is known as weather veining. Some manufacturers provide crosswind component charts which list the maximum demonstrated crosswind component velocity. Before beginning the takeoff roll, check the wind sock to determine the wind direction and then position the ailerons into the wind. Full aileron deflection may be required at low speeds when control effectiveness is minimal. As the speed increases and the ailerons become more effective, you may gradually reduce the amount of aileron deflection. Hold the airplane on the runway until attaining a slightly higher than normal liftoff speed. At this point, establish the normal climb attitude by applying elevator back pressure. When the airplane is airborne, make a slight coordinated turn into the wind to establish a drift correction or crab angle. Once the correction is established, level the wings and maintain the drift correction angle to climb out along the extended runway center line. As you practice takeoffs in various wind conditions, you will become increasingly comfortable with them. One of the most important places you'll apply the skills of straight and level flight, climbs, descents, and turns is in the traffic pattern. Each runway has its own traffic pattern. The traffic pattern is a rectangular course located adjacent to the runway. It is used to keep landing and departing aircraft in an orderly flow and definite path about the airport. Traffic patterns have several segments or legs. The downwind leg runs parallel to the runway and is flown in the opposite direction of landing. 
Most of this leg is flown in straight and level flight. As you approach the end of the downwind leg, you begin a descent, then make a descending turn to the base leg. The base leg is flown in a straight descent. When you near the extended center line of the runway, you make another descending turn. The final leg is a descent along the extended center line until landing. When you take off, the straight ahead climb is called the takeoff or departure leg. Like the final, it is flown along the extended center line of the runway. If you elect to depart the pattern, you can either fly straight out or turn 45 degrees from the departure leg. If you are returning for landing, you can make a climbing turn to the crosswind leg. Notice that all the turns made in this pattern are to the left. This is a standard left-hand traffic pattern recommended by the Aeronautical Information Manual and is the most common type in use. When turns are made to the right, it is called a right-hand traffic pattern. It's used for a number of reasons, such as keeping traffic away from noise-sensitive or dangerous areas. They are also used at airports that have parallel runways. In this situation, the right runway will have a right traffic pattern. This allows for simultaneous approaches and prevents the two runway traffic patterns from overlapping each other. Now that you have an understanding of the basic left-hand traffic pattern, let's look at how to use it. Most entries into the traffic pattern are made by intercepting the downwind leg at a 45-degree angle to the midpoint of the runway. Before you reach the entry point, you should be at the traffic pattern altitude, which is usually 1,000 feet above the airport elevation. As you approach a non-towered airport, monitor the common frequency and look for any traffic that may already be in the area. Look for airplanes that are turning onto downwind from the crosswind leg. In addition, be alert for airplanes that are flying a wider or closer pattern than yours. Also watch for slower airplanes ahead of you that can create a spacing problem. Before entering the downwind leg, announce your intentions on the common frequency. Longmont traffic Cessna 66091 entering downwind for runway 29er, touch and go, Longmont. Upon intercepting the downwind leg, turn and fly parallel to the runway. Your heading should be approximately 180 degrees from the runway heading. This leg is flown between one half to one mile from the runway. The point on the downwind leg when you are abeam your intended landing spot is where you generally begin your descent. Upon reaching the position approximately 45 degrees from your intended landing spot, check to make sure there is no other traffic already established on the base leg. Then begin your turn. Longmont traffic, Cessna 66091, base, runway 29er, touch and go, Longmont. The base leg is flown with a ground track which is 90 degrees to the runway. Once you're on the base leg, you will decide if your approach needs to be adjusted for wind or traffic. Before you turn on to final, make sure there is no other aircraft established on the final approach path. Longmont traffic, Cessna 66091, final, runway 29er, touch and go, Longmont. When you roll out on final, you should be no closer than one quarter mile from the runway. This leg is flown directly along an extended center line of the runway. When you depart a runway, you should continue straight out along the extended center line until you are past the departure end of the runway and within 300 feet of the traffic pattern altitude. At this point, you have the option of departing the pattern straight out or making a 45 degree turn away from the departure leg. You can also make a climbing turn to the crosswind leg and return for another landing. In either case, you should announce your intentions. At a tower-controlled airport, the controller may specify the type of departure to be flown or you can request a specific type of departure. When you approach a tower-controlled airport, you may also be asked to fly a modified traffic pattern to keep the traffic flow smooth. For example, a controller may ask you to enter and report base leg. If so, you should not fly the normal downwind, just the base and final legs of the approach. In this program, you have learned how basic flight maneuvers are used to fly the traffic pattern. These skills are the foundation for learning good approach techniques.
Landings are a challenging but rewarding part of your flight training. A well-executed landing demonstrates that you have the ability to perform basic maneuvers, plan approaches, and use proper landing procedures. A typical landing approach in a training aircraft begins when you enter the downwind leg at a 45-degree angle, about mid-field to the runway. Usually, you're at cruise speed. By entering the pattern at mid-field, you have sufficient time to establish a track parallel to the runway and stabilize your attitude and airspeed. Once you're established on downwind and have completed your pre-landing checklist, you can use your heading indicator to help you maintain the proper distance from the runway. You can do this by visualizing the landing runway superimposed over the heading indicator. For example, if 2-9 is the landing runway, you can fly a parallel but opposite course by flying the reciprocal heading of 110 degrees. When at a point opposite the intended landing spot, you normally reduce power and maintain your altitude until the airspeed slows to the initial approach speed. If you intend to use flaps during the approach, lower them to the first increment when the airspeed is within the white arc. The use of flaps allows you to make a steeper approach without increasing airspeed. It also allows you to touch down at a slower speed with a corresponding shorter ground roll. Throughout the approach, use trim to relieve control wheel pressure. When the airplane slows to the approach airspeed, begin a descent. However, maintain the downwind heading until your intended point of landing is approximately 45 degrees behind the aircraft. Then initiate a medium bank turn A glance at your heading indicator will help you determine the proper rollout point. You already know that the base leg is approximately 90 degrees from the runway. So when the visualized runway is 90 degrees off the nose of your aircraft, you are on the correct heading. During the base leg, lower the second increment of flaps if they are being used and adjust the power as necessary to maintain the desired approach path and airspeed. Complete the turn to final so that the airplane is aligned with the runway. At this point, adjust your final approach to intercept the glide path, lower the final increment of flaps, and trim the airplane. If precise control is maintained throughout the landing, the time from power reduction to the touchdown phase will be approximately the same on each approach. During the touchdown phase, you will need to flare or rotate the airplane to the touchdown attitude. At approximately 10 to 20 feet above the runway, initiate the flare by applying gradual back pressure on the control wheel. This decreases the rate of descent and airspeed. As you begin the flare, reduce the power to idle if you haven't already done so. The airplane should reach a zero rate of descent when the main wheels are just off the runway at an airspeed just above a stall. The attitude at touchdown should be very close to the takeoff attitude. The main gear should touch down first with the nose gear clear of the runway. After touchdown, maintain back pressure to prevent abrupt nose wheel contact with the runway. After the nose wheel has settled to the runway, Gradually relax the back pressure to provide positive nose wheel steering. Throughout your training, you should try to be as consistent as possible to reduce the number of adjustments needed in the traffic pattern. However, you may have to alter the pattern for local procedures or for proper spacing behind other aircraft. If adjustments are required, you can make them in several ways. You may vary power or change the starting point of the descent. You may also extend the downwind or delay flap extension. The earlier you recognize a need for adjustment, the smaller the correction will have to be. To fly a consistent pattern, you must compensate for the effects of wind. In order to do this, you must be able to fly a straight line over the ground, regardless of the wind direction. If there is no wind, Tracking a straight line is nothing more than pointing the nose of the airplane in the direction you want to fly. However, 
If the wind is blowing at an angle to your flight path, it will blow you off course unless you take corrective action. You will need to position the nose of the airplane into the wind just enough to stop the drift. The angle formed between your heading and the ground track is called the crab angle or wind correction angle. How much you crab into the wind will depend on the direction and speed of the wind as well as your direction of flight and airspeed. For example, if the wind is directly down the runway, you must crab the airplane into the wind on the base leg. If you don't apply any correction, the airplane will drift further from the runway, increasing the length of the final approach leg. Strong winds not only affect the base leg, but also have a marked effect on the final approach. When you turn into the wind on final, your ground speed is reduced. However, the rate of descent remains the same. If you make no corrections, touchdown will be short of the intended point. Therefore, use additional power and increase the pitch attitude slightly to maintain the proper glide path and approach. After the correct glide path is established, try to maintain a constant approach angle. In this way, the apparent shape of the runway will remain fixed. A shorter, wider shape indicates you're low on the approach, while a longer, narrower shape indicates you're too high. If the approach is high, the normal reaction is to lower the nose and dive the airplane at the intended point of landing. While this may increase the rate of descent slightly, the most pronounced effect is that it will build up excessive airspeed, which significantly reduces the time it takes to descend. Therefore, the airplane will still be high as it approaches the threshold. In addition, the excess speed requires time to dissipate, so the airplane may float well beyond the touchdown point. The proper corrective action is to reduce power, extend additional flaps if available, and maintain the proper approach attitude and airspeed. This should increase the rate of descent without reducing the time to the threshold. Another way to lose altitude is to use a forward slip. This is accomplished by lowering the upwind wing and applying sufficient opposite rudder pressure to displace the nose of the aircraft toward the high side of the bank. This increases drag by presenting a larger surface area to the relative wind, with a corresponding increase in the descent rate. If you use a forward slip to lose altitude, establish a normal descent before making the transition to the touchdown phase. Not every one of your landings is going to be perfect. Therefore, you need to know what to do if your approach and landing are something other than normal. For example, if the airspeed is low during the flare, you should delay the power reduction. This will help prevent a rapid loss of altitude with a high sink rate and possibly a hard landing. Conversely, if airspeed is higher than normal, maintain just enough back pressure to keep the airplane in level flight until the excessive airspeed has dissipated. Then continue the flare until the airplane touches down. Flaring too early or too late can also present a problem. If you begin the flare too soon, the airplane may stall prior to touchdown. The resulting high sink rate and hard ground contact may result in structural damage to the landing gear and its supporting structures. If you flare too early, add power and stabilize the attitude in a position from which you can make a normal landing. However, if insufficient runway remains, initiate a go-around. If your flare is started too late, you may touch down at a high rate of descent and the airplane may bounce. If the airplane bounces just a few feet in the air and you have plenty of runway left, you might consider placing the airplane back in the landing attitude, adding a little power and letting the airplane settle back onto the runway. Under many circumstances, however, it is best to initiate a go-around by applying full power and adjusting the pitch to the takeoff attitude. Then when you have enough airspeed, make a normal climb out. If the flaps are extended, slowly retract them as the airplane gains altitude and airspeed. 
As you gain experience, you will develop the ability to analyze and recover from an awkward situation and make a normal landing. But if you're ever in doubt about the outcome, a properly executed go-around is your best bet. An approach and landing in a crosswind is essentially the same as an approach made into a headwind, except that now you need to compensate for the wind drift. Each leg of the traffic pattern may require a crab angle to maintain a straight ground track. Before landing, however, you will use rudder to align the fuselage with the runway center line. At the same time, lower the upwind wing just enough to maintain the desired ground track. The result is a side slip into the wind, producing a wing low straight ground track that keeps the airplane over the runway. In this example, the crosswind is from the right. Early in the final approach, turn the airplane's nose into the wind and maintain a straight ground path. Before landing, however, lower the right wing into the wind and apply opposite rudder to align the nose with the center line. Execute the flare exactly as you would if the wind was straight down the runway, except now the upwind main gear will touch down first. As the airplane decelerates, continually increase the aileron deflection to prevent the upwind wing from rising. When you have mastered the procedures presented here, you will be able to land the airplane consistently and safely in crosswind situations.